This is a homily for the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verses 4 to 6 and verses 8 and 9. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. If you would like to receive a copy of the text of my homilies as a PDF file, please email me at jeffreyplant47 at gmail.com. Allow me to introduce you to one of my favourite churches in Rome. This is the church of Santa Sabina on the Aventine Hill. It was built between 422 and 432 AD, so it's one of the oldest churches in Rome. This is also the church where each year the Pope celebrates the Mass for Ash Wednesday. It is therefore the first of the Lenten Station Churches. It has been the mother church of the Dominican Order since the 13th century. And the Dominican Priory is adjacent to the church. The great medieval theologian St Thomas Aquinas lived here for a while and walked these very cloisters. St. Thomas Aquinas is one of the church's greatest theologians. While St. Thomas lived here, he began writing his theological masterpiece, the Summa Theologica. That translates as Summary of Theology. The Summa became one of the most influential works of Western literature. It was a compendium of the church's theological teaching at that time. But listen to what St. Thomas has to say about our quest for God. Writing in Latin, he says, Quidquid potest intelligi vel cogitare minus est ipsodeo. Whatever can be known or understood is less than God himself. In his work De Veritate, he writes, the essence of God himself remains forever hidden from us. The most we can know of God during our present life is that he transcends everything that we can conceive of him. In other words, God is totally other. The word we use for this concept is transcendence. But Transcendence leaves us uncomfortable, and the perennial human temptation is to attempt to package and label God, to reduce the divine to a manageable size. Pope Benedict offers an interesting insight into a scene that is recorded in chapter 32 of the book of Exodus. The people reach Mount Sinai, and it is there, on this mountain, that Moses receives the law of God. But, while Moses is on Mount Sinai, the people become restless and impatient. They prevail upon Aaron, the brother of Moses, to make them an image that they can worship. They want a God that they can see and touch. So Aaron fashions them a golden calf. Does this mean that they have abandoned God to worship a mere image? Pope Benedict says, no, they haven't abandoned Yahweh, their God. So, what is happening here then? Pope Benedict says this, The people cannot cope with the invisible, remote and mysterious God. They want to bring him down into their own world, into what they can see and understand. And that remains a perennial human temptation. We try to make God fit into our preconceived thoughts and ideas. In other words, we try to tame God, to domesticate the divine. St. Augustine tells us how futile that is. He writes, Si comprehendis, non es Deus. Si comprehendis, if you comprehend, non es Deus. It isn't God. So if you think you've understood what God is all about, 
whatever it is you think you've understood certainly isn't God. The Shack is a novel written by William P. Young in 2007. As you can see, it sold over 18 million copies and topped the New York Times bestseller list for over 50 weeks. The novel was subsequently made into a movie that was released in 2017. It starred Octavia Spencer and Sam Worthington. Sam Worthington plays the role of Mackenzie Phillips, known as Mac. Sadly, his youngest daughter, Missy, was abducted during a family vacation, and there is strong evidence that she was brutally murdered in an abandoned shack in the wilderness. However, the mystery remains unsolved. Some four years after her abduction, Mac receives a type letter. It's signed, Papa. That is the name that his wife uses for God. Mac is invited to come to the shack. It's an offer to help him come to terms with what has happened to his daughter in that shack. And so he goes to the shack and is greeted by God, Papa, the role played by Octavia Spencer. So, God appears as an African-American woman. Mac tells God, I think it would be easier to have this conversation if you weren't wearing a dress. But God replies, To reveal myself to you as a very large white grandfather figure with flowing beard, like Gandalf, would simply reinforce your religious stereotypes. And then God says, I am above and beyond all that you can ask or think. And that is exactly what St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine are saying. Whenever we try to think of God, to imagine what God is like, we experience a tug of war. On the one hand, God is transcendent. On the other hand, God is imminent. By the way, don't confuse two very similar sounding words, imminent and imminent. Imminent spelt with an I means that something is about to happen. Imminent spelt with an A means indwelling or existing within. It comes from the Latin word in, which means in, in English, and the verb manere, which means to stay or remain. When applied to God, the word imminent means that God permanently pervades and sustains the universe. Transcendence is a way of describing the total and utter otherness of God. No human words, concepts, images or ideas can even make a beginning in our quest to know what God is like. But, as Christians, we believe that God has chosen to reveal himself through the intimate, personal presence of Jesus. So God is both hidden and revealed. The first reading today from the book of Exodus and the gospel reading are both about the imminence of God. While on Mount Sinai, Moses appeals to God, Lord, let my Lord come with us, I beg. And God does remain with his people, present to them in the tent of meeting, the forerunner of what will eventually be the temple in Jerusalem. The tent of meeting, and eventually the temple, is the meeting place of heaven and earth. In the innermost sanctum, the Holy of Holies, God dwells among his people. In the prologue of John's Gospel, we read that the Word became flesh and lived among us. The Greek word that John uses, translated here as lived, is 
That word comes from the Greek verb skenoo, which means to dwell in a tent. So a literal translation of John 1.14 is, The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. Jesus, the word become flesh, is the ultimate expression of God's imminence. In Jesus, God dwells with us. In the words of Matthew's Gospel, he is Emmanuel, a name which means God is with us. And why has God come to dwell among us? Today's Gospel tells us that God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. Why do we need to be saved? Well, let's have a look at the backstory to the Gospels. God creates human beings and breathes a breath of life into them. He plants a garden, the Garden of Eden, the place where the man and the woman will live. They are told that they can eat the fruit of any tree in the garden with one exception. They must not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the man and the woman rebel against God. They take the forbidden fruit and eat. And as a result, they are banished from the garden. Henceforth, they will eat the produce of the land only after much sweat and toil, until they return to the dust from which they were taken. The man and the woman now live in a state of exile, alienated from God, against whom they rebelled. The American theologian Fleming Rutledge describes the predicament of humanity in these words. From beginning to end, the Holy Scriptures testify that the predicament of fallen humanity is so serious, so grave, so irremediable from within, that nothing short of divine intervention can rectify it. She also says, the human heart needs to be changed from the bottom up, but it cannot be changed by our natural strength and good works. It can be changed only by the intervening presence of the living God. The scriptures offer a range of images, analogies or metaphors to describe the human condition. We are lost. In Psalm 118 we pray, I am lost like a sheep, seek your servant. We are prisoners, Jesus tells us. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. We are burdened by debt. St. Paul tells the Colossians, Jesus has wiped out the record of our debt. We have been wounded and need to be healed. We are dirty and need to be washed. In Psalm 50 we pray, Wash me more and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. We are drowning and need to be saved. In Psalm 68 God promises his people, I will bring them back from the depth of the sea. We are slaves, hoping that there is someone who can pay the price to set us free. We have been kidnapped and we're longing for someone to pay the ransom. We have been exiled like the Jewish people in Babylon and we long to return home again. We are archers aiming for the bullseye, but we miss the mark. We stumble around in the darkness, unable to find our way. We are trapped like a bird in the fowler's net. We have been enslaved. We are dead and seek to be brought back to life. We have been put on trial, but found not guilty. These are but a few of the images that we find in the scriptures that offer a diagnosis of the human condition. And they are the reason that God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. And that is exactly what the name Jesus means.
God saves. Jesus is Saviour. He is the Redeemer who pays the price to set us free. As we saw last Sunday, John's Gospel begins with exactly the same words as the book of Genesis, in the beginning. And why? Because Genesis is the story of God's creation and of human rebellion, and John's Gospel is the story of God's re-creation, of God restoring what had been thwarted by human sin. And so the divine word becomes flesh and lives among us so that we might be saved. But we might wonder, why did Jesus have to die such a painful and shameful death? Wasn't there an easier way? If God created the world by the power of his word, why can't he recreate the world by the power of his word? The answer is, of course, God is all-powerful and could certainly have set things right by the power of his word, but he chose to do it by dying on a cross. Why? In responding to that question, New Testament scholar Tom Wright makes this observation. You do not have to be able to answer the question why before the cross can have its effect. Think about it. You don't have to understand music theory or acoustics to be moved by a wonderful violin solo. You don't have to understand cooking before you can enjoy a good meal. In the same way, you don't have to have a theory about why the cross is so powerful before you can be moved and changed, before you can know yourself loved and forgiven because of Jesus' death. It's true. I might not know the first thing about cooking, but I can still enjoy a good meal. I can enjoy fine music without knowing how to read music. And a vaccine is effective even if I don't understand how it works. If the Bible uses images, analogies and metaphors to describe the human condition, I think it also offers us images that tell us about God's presence and action in the world. Consider this image that is used in the letter to the Hebrews. The image is that of the prodromos, a word translated from the Greek as forerunner, precursor or advance guard. In the plural, prodromoi, it describes the scouts or advance guard of the Roman army. They go ahead to prepare the way for the army to follow. It was the word used for the pilot boat that escorted ships safely into harbour. Jesus is the way, but before calling us to follow him, he has travelled the way ahead of us. He is the prodromos, He does not ask us to bear any burden that he has not already shouldered. God could easily have healed a broken world through the power of his word. But love never seeks the easy way out. God doesn't remain uninvolved or detached or impersonal. God does, in fact, heal a broken world by the power of his word by his word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And as the word made flesh, he took upon himself the very worst that human beings can inflict upon one another. He endured evil, rejection, shame, pain and suffering, and ultimately death. And by doing that, he broke the stranglehold that sin and death had over us. He set us free. On this feast of the Holy Trinity, we reflect upon the question, Who is God? And the lesson of today's feast is, we can discover God by looking at Jesus. Let me return to St Thomas Aquinas. In 1273, he was still writing his monumental work, The Summa Theologica. On December the 6th, 
1273, the feast day of St. Nicholas. He celebrated Mass in the chapel of St. Nicholas in Naples. But during the celebration of Mass on that day, something extraordinary happened. An experience so overwhelming that he never wrote or dictated another word. When his confrere, Brother Reginald, asked why he was no longer writing, Thomas replied, Brother Reginald, I cannot do any more. Brother Reginald waited a while before raising the matter yet again. He received the same reply, I cannot do any more. Everything I have written seems to me as straw compared to what I have seen and what has been revealed to me. Thomas died in the early hours of March the 7th, 1274, in the Abbey of Fossanova in Latina, about 100 kilometres southeast of Rome. He was 49 years of age and had written more than 40 volumes. Let me conclude with a hymn Thomas wrote, Adoro te devote translated into English by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Godhead here in hiding, whom I do adore, masked by these bare shadows, shape and nothing more. See, Lord, at thy service, lo, lies here a heart, lost, all lost in wonder, at the God thou art.